Okay, um, perhaps we can start again. Hello everyone and uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the second lecture session of the second critical conference. Again, our theme for the whole lecture series this year is entitled From Wisdom's Special Workshop to Factories of Knowledge, the Place of University in Culture and Society. I am Jesse Joshua Lino from the Department of Philosophy of the University of Santo Tomas, and I will be moderating for today's session. Um, let us uh, start with a short prayer and let us put ourselves in the presence of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Um, thank you, Almighty God, uh, for this day, and we hope that you will guide us every day. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Now, uh, to formally, uh, before we um, move on to the lecture proper, let us hear once again the opening remarks for this session uh, from our very supportive chair from the Department of Philosophy, Dr. Jovito Carino. Uh, hello, Dr. Jovi. Hello. Uh... I mean, just fix my camera, no? Di ko, yan. Hello, sir. Nakikita ba ako, Jesse? Yes, po. Okay, magandang hapon. Uh, and once again, uh, we are here in the, I was supposed to say, third critical conference, no? Pero second pa, second pa rin pala ito. So we thank everyone for joining once again this uh, second leg of the second Critique Conference. And this afternoon, we are fortunate to listen to Doc Pao Bolaños uh, in our continuing uh, philosophical reflection on the state and the present crisis of the university. And just like, uh, just like uh, last weekend, I hope uh, this afternoon session will be as meaningful and as fruitful for all of us. Maraming maraming salamat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jovi Carino. Uh, again, I would request our participants to put your microphones in mute as the lecture is being held. And now to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Paolo A. Bolaños is a full professor and member of the Department of Philosophy of the University of Santo Tomas. Uh, he headed the department, he was former chair actually, uh, from 2011 to 2019. He also served as program lead for philosophy at the USD Graduate School since 2013 up to 2020. Dr. Bolaños is research fellow at USD Research Center for Culture, Arts, and Humanities. He obtained his AB in philosophy uh, from UST, his MA in Philosophy in Brock University, Canada, and his PhD in Philosophy from Macquarie University in Australia. His research and teaching interests are mainly on the works of Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, Theodore Adorno, Gilles Deleuze, Frankfurt School Critical Theory, and Post-Marxism. Dr. Bolaños is founding editor-in-chief of two philosophy journals, um, Critique, uh, the first one being Critique, an online journal of philosophy, and the other is Suri, Journal of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines. Uh, he is also a member of the editorial boards of various academic journals such as the Antoninus Journal, Diwa, a Social Ethics uh, Journal of Applied Philosophy, and the Fabius Minda Journal. He is the author of two books, On Affirmation and Becoming, a Delusion Introduction to Nietzsche's Ethics and Ontology, published in Cambridge Scholars, publishing uh, the United Kingdom. And the other is Nietzsche and Adorno on Philosophical Praxis, Language and Reconciliation, Towards an Ethics of Thinking, published in Roman and Littlefield, the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Bolaños is also a member of the philosophic, rather, um, Philippine Academy of Philosophical Research here in the Philippines. And personally, I have worked under his mentorship during the course of writing my thesis, and I'm witness to his contribution to developing university work, whether it be academic or administrative. Today, he will be presenting his lecture entitled, Speed and its Impact on Learning, Preliminary Notes on a Dromology of Education. So without further ado, uh, let us welcome Dr. Paolo A. Bolaños. Uh, hello, Doc. Hello, Jesse. Um... Am I, uh, hello, good afternoon. Hello, Jesse. Thank you very much. Uh, am I being heard? Am I clear? Uh, yes, yes, Doc. Okay. 
and do I have a uh, is my face on the screen? Yes, doc. All right. Uh, let me just uh, go to my slides. I'll share with you my slides. All right. Um, hopefully, I'm still being heard. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, of course, the organizers of uh, the conference, um, uh, uh, Dr. Reniel Reyes and his team, uh, Jesse, and of course, Aldrin. But I'd like to also um, send out my special thanks to uh, Mr. Rainier Abenganya, uh, who's part of the Critique Editorial Board, who actually conceived uh, the uh, theme of the conference. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Jovito Carino for his uh, opening remarks. All right, uh, before I uh, uh, present my um, you know, before I present, it's not a paper exactly, but I, before I uh, do my presentation, I'd like to um, <clears throat> uh, confess that um, nothing in my presentation is entirely original or new, rather, um, because um, it's actually a combination of two things that, uh, or two, well, one is a lecture that I've done several years ago, and the other one is an opinion piece uh, that uh, I published uh, in 2019 in the Philippine Daily Inquirer, um, <clears throat> which was about speed and its impact on education. Uh, so for those of you who have already read that piece, uh, <clears throat> it, it, uh, you will realize that much of what I'm going to say here today uh, is derived from that piece that I uh, published uh, in 2019. Um, but uh, of course, I tried to corroborate uh, that uh, opinion piece with, uh, you know, ideas from other writers uh, in order for me to um, make sense of the impact of acceleration or speed on higher education in particular. Um, the title, actually, uh, the actual title of my presentation is When Do We Hit the Brakes? Uh, it's something that, uh, it's a question that I will return to later on uh, because it's, uh, it's a question I believe that all of us, um, administrators, academics, and students will have to uh, ask ourselves um, because it's a question that um, profoundly impacts the way we conceive education today and the way we uh, should envision education in the future. Um, so when do we hit the brakes? Speed and its impact on learning. Um, the idea of dermology is something that I will explain later on. Uh, it's an idea that I borrow from uh, Paul Virilio, the Italian philosopher. Um, uh, but it's some it, it's an uh, it's an image of thought that I use to 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 um, describe what I think is this uh, what I think is this specific mobility that you know. Uh, that structures uh, education today. Um, and I'll explain that uh, later on. But I'd like to share uh, this slide where I, um, you know, uh, present the talking points of my uh, lecture today. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six talking points. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, the uh, <clears throat> shift from uh, education, the shift of education from general good to narrow economic goals. Um, the second talking point is uh, about the rituals of verification. Uh, the third one 
on metric fixation, gaming, and counterfeit reflexivity. And then I turn to the idea of dromology. Uh, and uh, dromology, it's a dromology because I'm going to talk about education in the context of acceleration or speed. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is the question, again, I go back to the question, when do we hit the brakes? If we are accelerating too much and we are uh, in a way unwittingly not aware of the dangers of too much acceleration in education, I think it's high time for us to ask the question, when do we hit the brakes? So from the general good to narrow economic goals, uh, re-territorializing the corporation in academia. So how did we uh, re-territorialize re uh, corporation in academia? So education's shift from the general good of society to narrow economic goals is a global phenomenon. What is happening in the Philippine educational landscape today is a late manifestation of something that already occurred in places like the UK, the US, and Europe in the 80s. Philippine, Philippine higher education is at the crossroads between being a harbinger of knowledge and a servant of what I refer to as ultra corporate corpore, corporatization, corporatization. Or as the conference theme declares, that the university, university has shifted from wisdom special workshop to a factory of knowledge. So uh, you, know, you can imagine the university like uh, you know, a factory um, where you produce uh, goods, right? Uh, or consumer products. Um, you can imagine uh, you know, uh, a line, you know, the production line okay, where you produce products. And that the end, end result, of course, is a product. Uh, a consumer product. Uh, the question is: Is is uh, is 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 the university uh, the same as a factory? So today it is no longer the case, I believe, and I hate to sound pessimistic, but um, indeed I will sound pessimistic. So today it is no longer the case that higher education functions to develop culture via the cultivation of well-rounded human beings. I think uh, uh, un unwittingly, even as academics have already abandoned that uh, a core value, if you want to put it that way, uh, that education or, the uni or university education is for the cultivation of well-rounded human beings. As Bill Readings puts it in his 1996 book, The University in Ruins, uh, he says that the central figure in the university is no longer the professor, but rather the administrator. So the shift uh, from general good to narrow economic goals in the context of education um, can be understood as the shift from the, the, you know, the central role of the professor or the centrality of the role of the professor to the centrality of the role of the administrator or the manager, the, the educational manager. Uh, by this, Bill Readings means that the university is becoming a transnational bureaucratic corporation tied to transnational instances of government such as the European Union. Or in the case of the Philippines and other Southeast Asian nations, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or the ASEAN. The shift of emphasis from scholarship to administration further means that higher education, institu uh, higher education in institutions or what we usually referred to as HEIs, are forced to take on the task of a generalized logic 
of accountability. In other words, HEIs must pursue excellence, you know, uh, and those are the bywords today, excellence, quality, uh, accountability, and so on. Um, readings continues, and I quote, the current crisis of the university in the West, and of course now in Southeast Asia, proceeds from a fundamental shift in its social role and internal systems, one which means which means that the centrality of the traditional humanistic disciplines to the life of the university is no longer assured. Uh, we're just lucky in the University of Santo Tomas that the humanities still like philosophy, literature, history still play an important or central role in the, uh, you know, in the, um, delivery of, of education or knowledge. Uh, the, uh, the question is until when will that, um, I, don't, I don't want to call it privilege, but when will that value uh, you know, last or how, how um, when, when will it stop rather? Um, um, when, we will, when will we stop believing that the humanities uh, are not important anymore? Um, um, of course, my hope is that it will, it will continue to be important for us. And not only in USD, but in all universities. Because uh, what makes a university a university is actually uh, its emphasis on the humanities. All right, so uh, I think that's the, the context uh, from which I'm coming from, you know, the, uh, the shift from uh, general go to narrow economic goals or the re-territorialization of the corporation in academia. In other words, it is as if uh, uh, universities or schools today are managed as if they are, they are uh, you know, corporations or, or factories uh, where we produce goods as, as opposed to produce well-rounded individuals. Um, that uh, uh, individuals will have something to contribute to society. Um, now I turn to the next uh, section, the rituals of verification. Um, by the way, I'm presenting these as, um, you know, uh, talking points. They are by no means uh, exhaustive explanations. I'm presenting them to you because um, hopefully later on, we will, when we have the opportunity to, you know, to discuss further, uh, I, would, um, I, I would say that your questions um, initiated, of course, by these talking points will be more interesting. Um, so, the, uh, the generalized logic of accountability that I mentioned manifests in higher education in at least two ways. First is what is, gen is generally referred to as quality assurance, which, or QA, right? Uh, most of us are already familiar with QA. Uh, and what QA does is... Uh, in the industrial setting, QA is a method used to prevent manufacturing defects, as well as a way of ensuring utmost customer satisfaction. This practice has been re-territorialized in higher education in the form of quality assessment of educational practices, um, or what some educational theorists would loosely call outcome accreditation. Um, second, a generalized logic. So th th that's the first manifestation of this generalized logic of accountability. The second manifestation of this generalized logic of, of accountability is also pra is practiced in academic research in, in, in the form of bibliometrics. Um, now, bibliometrics is uh, uh, in the 70s 
was uh, used by librarians, you know. It was practiced in library and information science um, <clears throat> to determine statistical data based on the quantity of citations that academic journals generate. So uh, in those years, bibliometric data are used by libraries to decide which journals to purchase or subscribe to. But in the past few decades, and especially today, the same method, you know, bibliometrics, has been used by university administrators and funding bodies to determine the quality of the research outputs of faculty researchers. In other words, what librarians call journal impact factor has been repurposed in the academic world as a measurement of the quality of research. Okay? Of course, this is something that I've already said before. Like I said, nothing here is entirely new. But I think uh, I, I'm convinced that I have to say these things again because as a community of scholars, we have not actually exhausted our, you know, this, we have not exhaustively discussed uh, this problem. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that we need uh, to continuously discuss this uh, problem, uh, which is, of course, part of the crisis of the university. Quality assurance, or what you call QA, is, of course, an offshoot of total quality management, right, or TQM, whose uh, raison d'etre is customer satisfaction. Okay? It's, its purpose for existence is customer satisfaction. The followers of this approach have der derived from TQM from the, uh, let me read that again. The followers of this approach have derived, derived from the TQM gods eight core values. Uh, customer, I don't know if I have it in the presentation, the core value, I think I have it here. But anyway, the, if you're familiar the, with the eight core values, uh, but for those who are not familiar, they are customer centeredness, okay? Total employee involvement, third process, fourth integration, fifth strategy, sixth continuous improvement, seven fact-based decision-making and the eighth uh, core value is communication. Um, <clears throat> it's the same set of core values that uh, QA followers apply in assessing quality uh, in education. Uh, the customer uh, or yeah, um, the, the student becomes a customer, okay. Um, total employee involvement, everyone is, in, is, is involved now, uh, and so on. Um, but I don't want to elaborate on that further. But with the growing popularity of the total quality management approach among government policymakers and school administrators, the most palpable instance of which is the adoption of the, of the technical language of the international organization for standardization, or ISO, in the sphere of academia. Now, this is a recent development. Um, but I find it a very curious type of mobility that has taken over the management of schools and universities. University administrators now gauge success based on uh, sat the satisfaction of customers or or what we call benefactors in the guise of measurable key performance indicators or KPIs and key result area areas or K KRAs. And KPIs and KRAs are measured in the classroom, for instance, in the form of measurable outcomes. Outcomes that students must be able to perform in standardized ways. Now there is this ongoing debate, of course, on how to uh, arrive at that goal, right? The problem is, uh, I think our we have focused more on 
the process of arriving at goals than actually arriving at goals. Now, ultimately, oh, sorry, this is, uh, that, that's a slide where the, uh, uh, the three, the, the eight core values of TQM are presented. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, TQM is, is concerned about, uh, it is concerned about the, the, the uh, quality of the product, product quality. Okay, sorry for that um, typo. And uh, the quality of the product, of course, depends on the satisfaction of the customer. Whether, for instance, a product is fit to be used. That is whether or not the product is defective. TQM, however, derived from a concept of quality uh, TQM, however, derived from a concept of quality. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, it, sorry, let me say that again, I rephrase that. Uh, it has derived a concept of quality rather from the engineering discipline, which, which later on uh, has been adopted in management. It was not only a, it is, it was not only a reterritorialized concept, but also a universalized concept. According to Michael Power, I quote, this managerial turn provided advisory opportunities for a new generation of quality experts and an organizational shift in the location of these experts up and away from the shop floor. End of quote. So, so what Power is actually saying here is this kind of managerial approach has provided opportunities for a generation of quality experts that um, assess quality not at the grassroots level, but from you know uh, from above or anywhere outside uh, the, the, the 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 actual you know um, the actual um, dynamics of um, let's say dynamics of teaching or research, okay? Um, away, as I said, away from the shop floor. Now that comes from his book, The Audit Society, which I highly recommend, Michael Power. Moreover, Power notes that the appeal of TQM and notions of quality lies in their ambiguity, their diverse and fluid meanings which do not necessarily correspond to common sense. Quality is not, a, in this, so in this context, then quality is not about high standards, but those which are uniform, predictable, and verifiable. Okay, so this is, these things actually sound very familiar to us now. Quality assurance as an element of TQM, according to uh, power, has more to do with a certain style of management process than actual quality. In other words, TQM is not about actual palpable quality, but rather about practices and procedures of production. Nevertheless, TQM is for Michael Power only a symptom of what he refers to as the audit society wherein rationalized rituals of inspection dominate organizational structures. These rituals of verification, according to power, produce, I quote, produce comfort and hence organizational legitimacy by attending to formal control structures and auditable performances measures. Even though audit files are created, checklists get completed and performance is measured and monitored in every uh, and ever more elaborate detail, audit nevertheless concerns itself with auditable, auditable form rather than substance. Um, so in other words, uh, one way of looking at that is uh, in the past years, uh, in the past decade, perhaps we have learned to adapt the language of total quality management. Um, 
And for the followers of this approach, something like uh, teaching, let's say, philosophy doesn't make sense if it, it is not translatable into the language of quality assurance or the language of total quality management. Um, so what happens is that uh, we follow the format, let's say of a syllabus, a specific format of the syllabus, we check you know, uh, boxes and so on. But uh, I think, and later I'm going to talk about this. I think there is, or uh, talk about it further. I think there's a disconnect between the language itself of TQM and what is actually happening at the level of teaching and the level of uh, research. And what is emphasized really is uh, whether um, a, a specific discipline could 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 adopt that uh, could adopt the language of total quality management. Um, moreover, Power writes, "I quote: Audit has become the now audit is um, of course what they use. Uh, the, the term audit is what they use in the UK to refer to accreditation. You know, um, as uh, accreditation or assessment." Okay. Uh, here in the Philippines, we're usually um, uh, familiar with the term accreditation or assessment and so on. Um, so he, he writes, Power writes, I quote, <clears throat> audit has become the control of control. Because if you think about it, uh, the university is already a form of control, but uh, interestingly enough, um, it seems like the university cannot legitimize itself if it does not invoke the control of an external factor. In, in this case, uh, accreditation by agencies and so on. Um, so audit has become the control of control where what is being assured is the quality of the control system systems rather than the control system systems rather than the quality of the first order operations it's the same i said that differently earlier it's uh, so so this is this kind of approach is concerned about the quality of the control system you know the quality so the processes you know what's on the paper is concerned about about that as opposed to the quality of first order operations at the grassroots level you know, actual teaching and actual research. Power concludes that, uh, sorry, uh, because he's uh, also quoting someone here, but he concludes um, that in such a context, accountability is discharged by demonstrating the existence of such systems of control, not by demonstrating good teaching, caring, manufacturing, or banking. It, what, what counts later on is what's on the paper, okay? And we are already too familiar with this. We complain about it all the time, okay? So I don't think, I, I, sometimes if I, uh, because I've presented these ideas several times already in different, uh, okay, on, on different, in different occasions, um, <clears throat> sometimes I feel like I, I'm already saying something very obvious. Um, but I think we, we still need to continue to, 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 to talk about them and debate on this thing. Um, all right, so uh, the, the, the rituals of verification, we are already familiar with these things. Okay? Um, uh, an accredita accredit accrediting body visits the university or visits the department. Um, <laughs> The funny thing is that we are visited every, I don't know, I have a feeling we are visited every three months, right? Or six months, but oh, that's, anyway. Um, now I go to the next uh, talking point, metric fixation, gaming, and counterfeit ref reflexivity. This obsession with quality assurance and bibliometrics boils down to what uh, Jerry Miller 
calls metric fixation. In his book, The Tyranny of Metrics, Muller lays down three characteristics of metric fixation. The first is that metric fixation is the belief that it is possible and desirable to replace judgment acquired by personal experience and talent with numerical indicators of comparative performance based upon standardized data metrics. And of course, that, 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 that thing is something that we experience in research today. Okay. Uh, the, the second um, uh, characteristic of gaming or metric fixation is, that the, is the belief that making such metrics public or transparent um, assures that institutions are actually carrying out their purposes. We call that accountability. Okay? The first one is metrics. Uh, when we try to judge quality based on numerical indicators, we call that metrics. Uh, when we try to make public the metrics, we call that accountability. And the third uh, uh, characteristic of met metric fixation is the belief that the best way to motivate people within these organizations is by attaching rewards and penalties to their measured performance. Rewards that are either monetary, pay, per per uh, pay for performance, or uh, reputational or ranking. So uh, if you're a researcher, um, uh, uh, you know, you are expected to publish in high ranking journals, uh, highly rated journals. But I have a problem, of course, with how we understand uh, rating, the rating of journals. Uh, but there's this uh, easy way for administrators to gauge whether a journal is highly rated or not. But of course, again, this is, this is, a, this is, a fic this is fictional, this is fiction. Um, um, uh, the easy way is, when, is to publish in so-called ISI or, 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 or Scopus journals. Um, but um, <clears throat> what we're looking at is just the tip of the iceberg, you know. The, the problem, my problem, I don't have anything against ISI or Scopus journals. I myself manage a journal that is uh, 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 recognized by both uh, the web of, web of Science and Scopus. My problem is when uh, we use those indicators as representative of what we call quality, right? Um, and in a larger scale, in the context of universities, universities, of course, today are um, competing for what I call uh, phantom ranking badges. Um, so institutional fixation over metrics, according to Miller, could result in the gaming of figures, okay? the gaming of figures. Uh, that is to say, the manipulation of figures, manipulating the figures in order to create the illusion that targets, the targets are achieved or surpassed. Uh, and of course, this doesn't only happen in education, it happens in other organizations as well, in, in government or in the, in the police system, okay? Body counts, right? Uh, in, in research, you, you count citations and so on, right? Um, the police force also has something similar when they count body, uh, when they count bodies, right? How many have you, how many, uh, for example, how many um, <clears throat> drug addicts have you, accounted for already or have killed. Right? So the number, the higher the number, we think that the higher the number, the better. Um, so to quote Miller at length, I, uh, I quote, 
gaming the metrics occurs in every realm, in policing, in primary, secondary, and higher education, in medicine, in nonprofit organizations, and of course, in business. And gaming is only one class of problems that inevitably arise when using performance metrics as a basis of reward or sanction. There are things that can be measured, definitely. There are things that are worth measuring, of course. But what can be measured is not always what it, what can be measured is not always what is worth mentioning, uh, measuring. What gets measured may have no relationship to what we really want to know. For example, the quality of a research work. If we just count the citations and never read an article, for example, an academic article, uh, we know that an academic art article can be cited uh, 10, 50, 100 times. But if you will not actually read the article, then uh, you are, yeah, in other words, um, if you're looking for the quality, or if you're looking for impact, the impact of the article, and just you just count the citations, then you will never get to know the real impact of that of that research work. Uh, so the costs of measuring may be greater than the benefits. The problem is we spend so much on measurements. Uh, but, you know, if you really want to know uh, the impact of, let's say, a research work, then read the research work. The things that get measured may draw effort away from the things we really care about. And measurement may provide us with distorted knowledge, knowledge that seems solid but is actually deceptive. End of quote. Now, another dimension <clears throat> of the phenomenon of metric fixation and its eventual gaming, uh, or to use uh, um, um, a Tagalog collo colloquial word, you know, yung dino doctor, dino doctor mo yung, you know, yung documents or whatever. So, another dimension to metric fixation and its eventual gaming is what Lewis Morley um, calls in her book, Quality and Power in Higher Education, Counterfeit Reflexivity. She calls it counterfeit reflexivity. I, I, I like the term, you know. I don't like what it means or rather what it denotes, but I like the term because it, for me, uh, it, 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 it captures precisely what's going on when we game the system. So this kind of reflexivity describes how the language of external quality assessors forces academics to not only present themselves in a semantics that is alien to their respective disciplines, but also to lie about the status of their academic credentials. Murley further, further maintains, and I quote, for quality assurance, reflexivity is prescribed and circumscribed by external agents. It allows very little theoretical departure or development. It can be another example of capillary power, which academics policing themselves with, sorry, with academics policing themselves and others in the service of quality assurance. This can result in an alienation that leads to a dissatisfaction caught between the state, employers, the market, industry, students, or consumers, and the wider economic concepts of globalization, employability, international competitiveness, universities, and academics. It's just talking about uh, the, 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 the situation in the UK. Universities and academics in Britain are struggling with a hybrid identity that can be demoralizing and confusing. Now, uh, Morley is describing something that happened in the United Kingdom or is happening in the United Kingdom. I think that it's something that's also happening in the Philippines or in Southeast Asia. 
uh, alienation in this context can be understood as you know the growing separation between one's work all right and one's personal identity uh, yeah, today it's very it's challenging to identify with one's work okay um, and so if you're a researcher most of the time what 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 happens is that you look for research topics that are remotely uh, or, or research topics that you are not really interested in, okay, or don't mean anything to you. But since you are playing the game, uh, then you, um, you know, work on something that doesn't really you know, mean to you. So that's a form of alienation. Now, that's in research. In, in teaching, a similar thing happens. And I'll talk about this towards the end, you know, this kind of alienation. I, I'll try to elaborate uh, on this idea because it's something that all of us are experiencing. Now, the problem with a counterfeit reflexivity, the problem with metric fixation, with gaming the system, and counterfeit reflexivity is that in the long run, we will get used to, uh, you know, uh, practicing inauthentic things, or we, we are we're going to use to do inauthentic practices, um, because at the end you get promoted if you have the right numbers, not whether you are actually, uh, you know. Uh, so again, it's just it, it doesn't have anything to do with quality. Quality in the guise of numbers, or rather numbers in the guise of quality, which is not quality at all. Um, so you get promoted not because you have done real work or authentic work, but because you were able to achieve the right amount of numbers. All right, okay, so moving on. Um, let's talk about dromology. The term dromology comes from the Greek words dromos and logos. Dromos means race, okay? Uh, and of course, logos is study or science. So the, uh, dromology is the science of speed. You know, uh, dromos is race or speed, right? Like the flash. Uh, and in the context of Paul Virilio, um, uh, dromology is usually associated with the study of technology and military. Uh, Virilio understood speed or acceleration. Let me let me again pause for a bit. When I when I uh, use speed or ac acceleration in education, I'm not referring to accelerated education in the context of uh, a smart kid uh, who's being who's being accelerated to a higher grade. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to the dynamics of education, you know. So, uh, so just to put this in context, uh, Virilio understood speed or acceleration as a normative condition for political and economic power. This means that the intensification of acceleration brings about social political and economic possibilities in society. In other words, what we usually refer to as societal progress or technological advancement for Virilio is conditioned not necessarily by the building of structures and networks, but rather by the rate or speed of mobility involved in building such structures and networks. In this context, we understand modernity via Virilio as a social organization weaved in accelerate or weave by acceleration as opposed to concrete and permanent structures or institutions. Um, acceleration, however, comes with a price. In as much as technological advancements radically condition our sense of time and space. 
As such, acceleration profoundly changes the way we interact with one another, thereby affecting how we behave and use our bodies. In other words, technological advancements occasioned by acceleration have not only impacted our lives by constantly changing the way we move, but have also resulted in damaging new practices that we unwittingly ignore. We choose instead to seek refuge in the idea of modern progress, right? Uh, so that's usually how we um, make sense of acceleration, you know? Uh, we are in the process of progress. Um, now in the book, The Original Accident, um, Virilio speaks of the invention of artificial accidents that come with technological inventions. He says artificial accidents, uh, the artificial accident, he says, results from the innovation of a motor or of some substantial material. In this context, a crisis such as the millennium bug, for example, is only real albeit virtually only because computer hardware is prone to breakdowns and computer software is far from immune to viruses, computer viruses that, that is. Likewise, traffic accidents did not exist in our collective vocabulary before the invention of the automobile. While the concept of derailment only came after the invention of the modern train. Artificial accidents or what I would call modern occupational hazards are conditioned by our accelerated production of things that alter our living environments and the manner of movement we have within these environments. This is the accelerated modern or uh, accelerated modern world we currently inhabit. And judging by the degree of speed we are experiencing, I believe that we are not going to hit the brakes anytime soon. Okay? We are forced to catch up, to keep up with the times, as they say. But how do we understand acceleration in the context of education? So then the, the next section is speed and TQ, MQA in education. Given the above description of speed, I think a similar phenomenon, if not an inflection, is happening in the, in the sphere of Philippine education today. Uh, TQMQA, in the context of education, is focused more on the, uh, as we have discussed, or as I have mentioned earlier, it is focused more on the processes and procedures related to what I think is erroneously dubbed as excellent services, like excellent teaching or excellent research. Uh, and, and also dub as products, right? the number of graduates or number of published articles. Uh, then with genuine, so there it's more concerned with these things uh, rather than with genuine quality. As such, the importation of TQM into education has profoundly altered how educational institutions are managed. They are now being run as if they are corporations or worse, factories, and as such, educational institutions must accelerate in the same way as corporations or factories accelerate. Quality assurance, much like in TQM, is preoccupied with the regulation of production hiccups or artificial accidents that derail production efficiency. In other words, the preoccupation of the current educational system here in the Philippines and elsewhere abroad has shifted from cultural and character formation to crisis management, because that's precisely what TQM tries to do, right? It's trying to manage crisis. Uh, it's trying to manage defects. So the less defects, the better the product and so on and so forth. Um, so much like the invention of new technologies and their concomitant artificial accidents, the tyranny of TQM has resulted in the invention of artificial accountability and a damaging culture of audit. And Stefan Collini, another British scholar, 
uh, argues in his book, Speaking of Universities, he says the logic of such culture of audit leads to, sorry, leads us to say that the value of playing Beethoven's piano sonatas is attested by the way it helps to make us better typists. A logic from which impact in its currently required form is not wholly exempt. For similar reasons, we are led to con connive in the fiction that an auditable paper trail is evidence of the presence of the relevant form of quality, end of quote. So um, that's from Stefan Collini. I recommend his book. Um, the book called Speaking of Universities. Uh, he has another book on um, the universities. Uh, it's called What Are Universities For? All right. Um, now I turn to the last uh, talking point. Uh, I'd like to go back to the question, when do we hit the brakes? It is, of course, indisputable that quality is an important aspect of education. This is something that could be agreed upon with, without much contention among academics and university administrators. However, what is at stake is precisely the kind of understanding we have of the idea of quality. With the current predominance of the TQM2A regime, while lip service is paid to a certain idea of quality, the real emphasis is on practices and processes that are perceived to result in an assurance of quality. Since the emphasis emphasis is on practices and processes, more specifically on what is merely written on paper, there is a disconnect between the goals of the TQMQI regime and the actual goals of academic disciplines. The unfortunate upshot of this disconnection is the alienation of academics, teachers and researchers, and of course students, from the real value of their works. Moreover, this overemphasis on what is on the paper, assessed by external agencies through their rituals of verification, results in the gaming of the system. Through this, badges are worn, you know, those phantom badges, those logos, are worn when schools and universities participate in the rituals of verification. This is the reason why. For example, two universities could have the same badges. You can have the ISO badge, the QS stars badge, and so on and so forth. Despite the fact that one university is perhaps uh, research oriented and the other one is not. Uh, so in that sense, there's, I think, a disconnect. At the end, what is cultivated by the regime, the TQ and QA regime, is not a culture of quality but a culture of counterfeit reflexivity. Now, to my fellow academics, if you do not understand what counterfeit reflexivity means, perhaps asking the following existential questions might help. First, when was the last time you actually drafted your syllabus for your students and not for accreditors? When was the last time you did not care about the format of your syllabus and cared only about the substance? The second existential question. When was the last time you felt that you are researching for the sake of scholarship and the creation of new knowledge? Or do you feel like research is just a game of racing for citations? Do you still feel that you are writing to be read? That is to make a point. Or are you writing to be counted? Lastly, the last existential question. How does your respective department spend its faculty's academic energies? Do you spend more time having academic discussions that relate to the real world? Or you have more time preparing for the next accreditation? Spend more time preparing for the next accreditation. 
So those are the existential questions that perhaps we need to ask ourselves in order for us to understand counterfeit reflexivity. University ranking mechanisms originally were mere reflections of excellent practices in education. Today, however, the ultima finis of universities is to be ranked or to be accredited or assessed or like, you know, it's basically perhaps the same thing, like. Uh, to use a more contemporary term that uh, you, you use in Facebook. It seems like we have a fundamental forgetfulness of the basic role of education, the cultivation of culture and the formation of character, which however require space for discussion and debate, time for thoroughness and focus for rigor. And you want to call it slowness. It's rather slow. Education is rather slow than fast. If you go too fast, then you will encounter a lot of problems because you will not have time to think and reflect on uh, what's going on. And of, and, and, and of course, uh, to, to remember the fundamentals and do the fundamentals of education. Now, uh, it seems like, uh, well, um, I wrote this in the opinion piece in 2019. I jokingly asked my students, uh, when was the last time you participated in anything remotely academic or scholarly in the university? All you see around you, this is of course prior to the pandemic, all you see around you are tarpaulins and 100, and 100 non-academic events happening at the same time. It seems like we don't have time to be a university. And paradoxically, we don't have time, but we behave in an accelerated and precarious fashion. So when do we hit the brakes? Thank you very much. I'll stop there. And I think we have a lot of time for uh, discussion. Thank you very much. OK, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Bolanos, for that uh, insightful lecture on speed and how the metric system of, uh, well, both of accreditation and the uh, assurance of quality continue to plague the university. Um, to our dear participants, the floor is now open for engagement. And again, uh, may we remind everyone that uh, everyone is actually enjoying to participate through the chat box on the right corners of your screens or by raising your hand. And once acknowledged by us moderators, you may open your web cameras and unmute your microphones. Participation may come from either uh, queries, comments, and sharing of insights relevant, of course, to the lecture. Okay, anyone? Um, I have seen a few comments, uh, all the while Dr. Bolaños have been discussing. Perhaps I could read them, at least some of them, uh, before I get to give uh, acknowledge some of the um, people raising their hands already. Okay. Uh, first, we have from Dr. Rans Cortez. Uh, I think they this was actually being mentioned during your discussion, specifically on the first part, um, where TQM actually is in relation to how it plagues the university in terms of quality assurance. We thought that during the pandemic, uh, as Sir Franz mentioned, accreditations will slow down. Now they are virtual. In the end, four things will last. Faith, hope, love, and accreditation. Do you have some comments to that? Uh, 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 to the comment of um, Dr. Cortez, uh, Dr. Bolaños. Thank you, uh, Jesse. Uh, thank you, Franz, for, <clears throat> for saying the truth. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, uh, well, the thing is that a lot of things have slowed down during the pandemic, uh, but uh, it, yeah, it seems like accreditation is, one, is not one of those. I, I think, uh, um, uh, and um, I don't have any uh, excellent explanation for that, aside from what I've already said, that it's part of, of, of the university's fixation with, you know, with, um, uh, uh, well, basically, you know, um, 
fixation with with um, counting, you know, merit badges. Uh, it's part of that. I, uh, and, and the thing is that uh, should we slow down? I think I've already, I, I've already, I've already uh, said my piece or my my position on it. I think we should slow down. I think the pandemic should have been an opportunity for us to slow down and reflect on what's going on and envision something uh, for the future of the university. Uh, we have not done that, unfortunately, because we were busy, uh, for example, uh, re revising our syllabi using a specific uh, uh, format, uh, and the fact also that you don't know anymore which format is acceptable. Um, then you just play the game, right? And then all our energies are exhausted because that's all that happens. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think um, <laughs> jokingly, of course, you said it in a, in a jokingly manner, but to some extent, I do agree with you. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, thank you, friends. Okay, um, another uh, comment uh, from Mom Fleur Aldez, Albella. Uh, she says that it is distressing to be gauged by the metrics of those who don't, uh, who don't know what we do, corrected by those who don't even understand the content of what we teach and write about. If this entire ordeal of accreditation and quality management means improving with the help and by helping our colleagues from other institutions here and abroad, excellence and quality assurance is most possible. How we love to be visited and commented by peers from um, Rome, Dublin, uh, Leuven, uh, Leuven rather, um, NUS, and uh, is this Chule uh, University by those who also are doing philosophy. So, yeah, thank you, Fleur. Um, now, uh, yeah, it's quite disheartening that uh, today, uh, what is what we you what we actually deem as important is something that is actually ignored by the system, you know, by by this uh, TQMQA system. We call it if you call it if you, for lack of a better word, that's one way of referring to it. Um, by the system of accreditation, the system of assessment that we have adopted, that we, are embrace, that we have embraced. Unfortunately, and I agree with you, that it's quite uh, disheartening and disappointing that uh, assessors seem not to understand what we truly value, especially, for, for example, in philosophy. But it, it's not just in philosophy. It's in all disciplines. Uh, most humanities disciplines, but especially philosophy, literature, and you know, and so on. Uh, so there are things that and core values that we think are the most important to us, but that th those are precisely the things that they seem to not recognize. So uh, during accreditation visitations, what are recognized are uh, things that are. Uh, you know, artificial, like uh, the <laughs> naka inis ng sabihin to, pero yeah, the format of the syllabus, right? Uh, the KPI, the KRAs, the outcomes, and so on. And no matter, uh, it doesn't even matter how you explain to them that, you know, uh, these are not the, the, the core values that, uh, uh, that, that we take into consideration. Uh, that is simply ignored. I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, an example. Um, um, this, was, this happened in 2019. Uh, I was still the chair of the department. And it was during the last accreditation visitation for level four. No, and I even forgot the name of the head of that accreditation team. Um, what I can remember is that she's from uh, uh, Osiris University. 
uh, but I forgot her name. Um, but but there's one thing that 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 bothered me when she was interviewing me, because there was this uh, one 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 on one interview, and and I think she also asked this to uh, Doctor, uh, you know, to the chair of the literature department, uh, Doctor Los Reyes. Uh, so, so one thing, so, so she said something that bothered me and, and, and she asked me, how can you make philosophy relevant? Okay. Of course, she will not take, uh, she will not take uh, uh, the usual way we answer that question because it's something that cannot be translated into K KRAs and KPIs and so on. You know, because KRAs and KPIs can only measure number of publications and so on and so forth. It cannot exactly measure uh, how a student, for instance, um, appreciate a, a, a philosophical text. Uh, and, and as to whether we need to measure that um, using uh, quick you know, measurements or, or numbers. Uh, and so she, that bothered me because she also said that right to my face, huh, in, she, she told me that she doesn't think that philosophy is relevant. She said, I, I, you know, I remembered my philosophy col uh, college professor and I was so bored because he was talking about Buddha, Taoism, and so on. Uh, the problem is, uh, and I hate to say this, but nangyayari talaga to, uh, and I'm just talking from experience. Most accreditors show their, uh, you know, ignorance um, when they talk that way. Um, and then uh, at the end of the accreditation visitation, uh, we were again specially mentioned, right? Uh, uh, she said that um, all, all the you know the requirements are there, or, or the credentials are there, publications, and we are the the most published department, and so on. But she didn't see how the discipline is relevant. Um, all right, so so th th that's the problem. That's the problem. Uh, it's this. Are, the, the problem is that rarely do we do we have um, um, a well grounded set of accreditors. Really, parang um, uh, yeah, we are credit. The, 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 but I think the problem is uh, the problem is that. There's this assumption that they're using a language that is uh, the TQMQA language in particular uh, that is um, um, how do I put this um, that that is they, they think that it's objective enough that it can uh, be used to interpret quality the quality of any type of discipline. So this, this this detachment is the problem. This 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 dissociated um, uh, this disconnect rather this disconnect is a problem because the language we understand that in philosophy the language is important. So if you're using a different language to understand a specific context, uh, an alien language to that context, that that, that um, and especially if that language is closed. It, it, it means that it does not allow for, um, you know, for um, kind of kind of uh, change or um, or penetration. Okay, uh, then uh, then problems arise uh, because um, the 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 problem. Later on, the, 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 the tendency is for us, for example, academics or the whole department using the language, using an alien language to make sense of what we're doing. Uh, and it's easier said than done. Um, kaya, 
if 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 the our language doesn't fit their language, uh, the end result is a negative assessment, and that's unfortunate. And I agree with you that uh, I I think that if we are serious about it, if we are serious about uh, quality, you know, then there should be a member of the accrediting board that is uh, familiar, if not also a specialist in that specific field. But most of the time that doesn't happen. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, perhaps before I continue uh, giving the comments to Dr. Bolaños, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, I think this is Father Jay Miranda. Uh, he has been raising his hand uh, uh, prior to the comments I have been reading. So, uh, Father Jay. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Father Jay. Hello, Father Jay. Uh, Dr. Pao, thank you. Yes. Thanks to your inputs. I think one of the works you published two years ago, I think I even used it in my class philosophy. Oh, education. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to that too. And then, uh, you know, I just have some comments, especially the point by point that you raise. You mentioned something about, for example, UST. You are hopeful that UST, uh, you know, as a Catholic university, would that be affected by this uh, marketing and industrial uh, level of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, of process that's happening now among universities. Uh, what I can say is, uh, maybe being a Catholic university, it has already a built-in protection. Uh, from being, you know, uh, focused only on, on uh, technological things that could sell in our time. But I think as a Catholic university, I say it's a built-in protection from all, uh, you know, industrialization and all this. It's because its main aim is the uh, development of the whole human being. Of course, uh, there is a theology part of that, no? Because, you know, uh, as a university, it looks at its, its stakeholders, humans as created in the image of God. And so uh, I think that's the main point there. No? Uh, hopefully that UST will not just be a victim of that marketing and industrialization effect uh, they are making now on university. And then in the rituals and uh, verification that you mentioned, I agree point by point what you mentioned. But on the other hand, I look at it as a administrator in a university. You know, uh, these things, uh, you know, TQM and all this uh, quality management and all this. I think this is the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, what I may call the uh, uh, business or the organization part of the uh, university, wherein I think it has to play the game that the world plays now on the universities. And I think many universities are really part of it, no? Mga metrics and all this. Uh, it is a game that the university plays, but I think the problem lies if, no? if my, uh, as you mentioned, raison d'etre, no? my reason for being is just to comply with what this accreditation and auditing would just want from me. Uh, uh, if that becomes my very own reason why I should exist as a university, I think that's where the problem lies. Because these TQM and all these metrics and all this uh, ritual verification, I think that's just a small fraction of the whole reality of the university. I don't know if you would agree with me. That's why uh, uh, I'd rather maybe uh, part of it, uh, the university is involved in it, but the problem is if my whole being is spent on that, that's where the problem lies. Uh, and I think uh, you cannot and also make uh, or to, to assume that, you know, the level of excellence of university can only be measured by that. That's where the problem lies. Uh, I think that's my point. We may play the game, but it doesn't mean I have to sell my soul to it because it's just a fraction of the whole reality of the university trying to excel, uh, trying to excel. And you cannot just measure excellence through that. I agree with you on that point.
But on the other hand, as I tell you, know, as a religious now, part of the management and part of the administration, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, there are some games we need to play from time to time. You know, having ISO and all this. I myself, no, sometimes I'm already confused about our schedules and all this. No? We need to comply with all these things. But, you know, it adds value. Uh, and so, okay, yeah, we do it. But it doesn't mean it is the be all end all of everything. And we have to focus more on some things that need to be, to be given attention as a uh, university trying to achieve excellence. And uh, you have mentioned something about, uh, about yes, accreditation as audit, no? uh, and the uh, dromology and the speed of the things that we do. We are so busy with all these things. You know? And I think it's the same thing with the way we handle our classes. When you know, uh, I think uh, what we have uh, inherited from the previous uh, century, like uh, industrialization and all this assembly line model of learning, grades and all this, I think they are all part of the, I don't know, no? they are still there, but before they are the uh, answer, now they have become the problem. They don't answer anymore. Our educational system doesn't answer anymore the 21st century need of humans. Uh, that, that's where I think uh, we have less uh, uh, progress. Uh, and I think uh, when you invited uh, William Spade, yeah, I think he himself said no, when he had a talk here, uh, anything that we do that is accreditation based and also audit based, anything that has something to do with time, when it is become time based or time bound, it is a suspicion whether it really provides an authentic point for learning because learning is something you cannot measure only by time. I, I'm not sure if you, if you would agree with that though, because for me, uh, learning is something that needs to be given a longer or nothing, a wider space no? uh, with all the things that you have mentioned. No? Are, are we really still paying attention to what the university is supposed to do? Uh, as I mentioned, no? uh, when it comes, if we really want to excel, and give uh, focus and attention to what you have mentioned. I think, kung ako masusunod, no, we have to give more space uh, for for people, especially in different uh, discipline. There is no one perfect formula that could be applied to all disciplines. Uh, I'm not sure if you would agree with me on that part. The natural sciences have. Uh, in a way, you know, have different needs and they have, uh, they, uh, I mean, a different metrics should be used on them. That should not be a, uh, a same metrics that could be applied to humanities, to social sciences, because otherwise, I think that's where the problem lies. And I think we need to be more conscious about that. When we are always working for uniformity, I, I myself know I am, I am more of a, you know, I am a proponent of diversity. Because in diversity, you would be able to answer what the discipline really needs. Uh, that's why no? uh, if the human uh, humanities need more space for this, then uh, that should be given to them if, they, if you want them to excel. If the natural sciences and uh, health sciences, health allied sciences need this, and this is how they would excel, then give it to them. But uh, what I'm conscious of is we cannot use one measure for everyone with all the discipline that we have. I think we will encounter a problem if we only have one metric for all disciplines. So Dr. Pao, thank you to your, uh, to your insights and I have learned a lot. And I'm enjoying this conference, this uh, four series. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you, Father Jay. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate your insights, Father Jay, uh, coming from an administrator. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that uh, and yeah um i agree uh my uh, my insights in a way are also insights uh from the point of view of the administrator yeah. because i've been yes, yes. Um, the chair of the department for uh how many years seven or eight years um and uh what i i learned a lot of course from how uh things are done you know administratively but at the same time, I also encountered uh, problems. Uh, I could perhaps refer to them, for lack of a better phrasing, uh, unnecessary complexifications of things uh, that pile up 
Uh, and in a way, from an administrative standpoint, because I am, of course, not the traditional administrator, um, I, my, my view, my, my focus really is, kung, kung pinag-uusapan natin outcome, outcome-based, may outcome-based talaga ako kung ang, if we're, we're talking about, for example, the outcome of, uh, of quality teaching or the outcome of quality research. Um, pero the thing is that uh, I, I, I believe that an out, and I agree, and yes, and I think you've, got, you've, you've understood my point that we actually, that learning requires time and space. Uh, and managing a university too, I believe, uh, requires space, uh, time, and enough time and space. Uh, in you cannot, you have to. We have to understand that by, for example, uh, in uh, let's say promising in your list of to do uh, or in your to do list rather of KRAs and KPIs that you need to publish, let's say ten articles a year. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen precisely because the fundamentals are forgotten. For example, you don't have the you don't have enough researchers, mm-hmm. or you have enough researchers, but you restrict the space yes. uh, for for innovation and the space for for you know for development, and um, basically uh, it, that translates into. Uh, I would say the uh, health, you know, of a department, you know, or a group of researchers, yung academic uh, intellectual health nila. Kasi um, if you restrict, for example, if you um, if you say that uh, uh, a quality uh, a research is only, or rather, how do I put this? Quality research is only. Uh, research that is published in these specific journals uh, and an international journal is an index, uh, a journal indexed by, let's say, the Web of Science or mm-hmm. Scopus. That's basically restricting the landscape. Yes, yes, yes. And if you, and of course, uh, the, the word impact factor is used to, to you know, to, to, to um, basically. Uh, refer to these things, but the thing is that um, uh, when you restrict this, the, the landscape, then you restrict possibilities. And the the thing is, if that that specific research is something local, meaning uh, the, the the significance of which or the impact of which is also at local, diba? is there a sense of publishing it in an international? journal uh, if nobody will read it anyway and if let's say the journal is not open access hmm. uh, and we've proven uh, we've already proven uh, many times that open access journals are read are, are well read because they're there uh, openly uh, available uh, as opposed to um, subs- uh, subscription based journals uh, so, so what is the point of research then? Kaya nga, yung, uh, towards the end, uh, one of my questions was, do we write or do we research to be read? Yeah. Or, are we, uh, or are we researching to be counted? So in the context, therefore, of recognition, when we want to recognize, to be recognized as, as a researcher, uh, my, myself, I want to be read or to be listened to. Mm. I don't care if you're going to uh, cite me because the thing is that citation will come naturally anyway. Um, but when we talk about quality, then how am I going to impact my listeners or my readers? Um, the impact really is in the, 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 the how do I call this? The, um, the actual reading, for lack of a better term, as opposed to, uh, all right, this article is published in this ISI journal or Scopus journal, but I haven't read it. So I really don't know whether it, the article will, will, will impact me or not. Kaya, pero if, uh, now, if that article is not published or, or published in a blog, for example, um, and I read it and it makes sense, that is, for me, a real impact. Um, uh, but anyway, um, 
complex kasi yung discussion na yan. We could uh, we, we could actually um, come up with another webinar for that. Yeah. But I yeah I do agree Father Jay. I do agree. As a matter of fact, I, I am uh, as a matter of fact, I'm I, I appreciate that you share your insights. Kasi uh, by sharing your insights, uh, I be, I think that there's hope for you esteem. <laughs> uh, uh, ituloy sa tingin ko ya, yeah, ituloy natin yung yan yung uh, kasi our vision no, our religious vision is tied really to how we are going to teach the humanities disciplines, including theology. Yeah. Yun dapat ang di mawala. Kasi kung mawala yung mga disciplines na yan, eh, wag na lang natin tawagin University if of Santa Fe. If you are allowed me to add, no, kukunti na lang. Uh, sabi nga ni Anna, you've heard of this, uh, the founder of this UCs, uh, University of California, Clark Kerr. Although he did say it in a Catholic uh, Catholic context, but he said the humanities, you know, is the soul of the university. Uh, you lose the humanities, you lose the soul of the university. In our part, I think it's the same thing. The Catholic teaching, the humanities themselves. Yeah, we cannot, we cannot, uh, we cannot afford to lose them because they are the soul of the university. What's still the meaning of being a university if they will be gone? Hindi mawa, hindi mangyayari yan. Sabi ko nga, no, may built-in ikana, no? may built-in protection ng university. It's just a matter of us, you know, how we deal with it, how we yes. strengthen it. Yes, and it's, thank it's, you very much po. Marami pa yata ang gusto nga. Yes. yes, thank you, Father Jay. It's the, I, thank you, Father Jay. It's the, I, just, just to add to that, it's the, I, it's the identity of the University of Santo Tomas. Yeah, yes. Uh, kaya yung, uh, what I share today is, in a way, I think a war, just a warning. Uh, we have to hit the brakes. Take uh, a We hit the brakes so that we could reflect on. Baka masyado na tayo mabilis. Yun ang aking point. And we forget the fundamentals. Thank you, Father Jay. Thank you. Okay. Um. Thank you, uh, Doctor Balanis and uh, Father Jay. Uh, another comment here from uh, Mary Sara Angolwan. Um. I think the problem of quality assurance can be found within the classroom setting, not just in the university as a whole. If we wanted to remove the quantification of the achievements of the university, I think we should or might as well uh, remove the grading system of the students as well. Although OBE is being implemented today, a grading system alienates students as much as quality assurance alienates the university to the quality of each achievements or I might be mistaken. So, um, any thoughts, Doc? Um, yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> this is my usual, uh, because I've been asked that question before, similar, similar question before, and my usual answer is, it's unfortunate that we have to still grade our students. Or it's unfortunate that we have to use numbers to, to, to grade our students. Um, I, I think uh, assessing is still a fundamental part of uh, teaching. Of course, we have to assess whether uh, students are learning. Uh, but not. But, but the thing is that no amount of grading really i believe uh is enough to assess a student what i mean by that is that it's unfortunate that uh learning is reduced to grading um and and that's at the level, as you said, at the level of the classroom but you elevate that was also elevated in the level of you know of um of the university um but how, how what kind of model then can we use uh, is it possible to assess students uh without using numerical grades and i think it's possible there are um uh, progressive schools that do that uh assessment is not based on grading uh, it's it really depends on the again it depends on the regime that is at, at play, regime or the the uh, 
uh, system that is in place. Um, uh, kasi ako, um, although of course I will have to use numerical grading, let's say, if I think that a student is excellent in a particular, uh, for example, in a paper, then I'll give the student. Ako, ang problema lang kasi hindi naman, uh, I, I, can, I can say that the, the paper is written excellently, but that, should, that will be translated into, unfor- again, unfortunately translated into a 95 or a 100. Um, but we have to, I, I think as, as, as educators, we have to, uh, we, we have to understand that, uh, that um, numerical uh, grades are not tantamount to actual learning. The problem is uh, students become grade conscious because the system, it, the system in place itself uh, allows for that kind of, uh, like I said, counterfeit reflexivity, right? As opposed to, for example, a student understanding that you know, you don't really need a grade in order to understand Plato, right? Do you, I need a, one, a, a grade to understand Plato? Uh, I'd rather read Plato uh, than going to a class, uh, listening to a professor who, do, do, who doesn't understand Plato and get, a one, uh, and, and get, and get an A for, for, for that class, right? Um, uh, but it's a culture I think that we need to cultiv- uh, cultivate. I mean, at, in, in the department, uh, it, it's a culture that we're trying to cultivate, at least in my, in my classes. No? Uh, it's not so much about the grades. Um, uh, much of learning happens outside the classroom. And what I mean by that is uh, be, be, being a mentor, for example, um, much of what I, I, I think my students and, and my advice is like Jesse could attest to this, that much of what they learned from me happened during uh, coffee, coffee, you know, coffee sessions, right? Uh, as opposed to in the classroom. But I try, I try to make my classroom, of course, as dynamic as possible, you know, uh, where we are able to discuss really, um, let's say a particular philosophical theme openly. And that's what a university should be. And that's the role of the humanities. Kaya dapat hindi masyadong, uh, I think the humanities should not be uh, gauged based on numbers, but be gauged based on uh, assessment, uh, no, gauge or assess based on um, what actually happens during uh, conversations, right? Um, say that, that, that doesn't translate into numbers. Um, all right, I don't know if I, I, I uh, answered your question, but I uh, hopefully in a way. Yes, sir. thank you, Doc. Um, there is another comment here uh, by Bjorn Serad Ramirez, uh, but I think you your uh, previous uh, comments to the uh, previous comment rather uh, is of course uh, in relation to what you have said earlier um, let I might as well read it uh, this is true outside of university um, our schools or our school in Green Hills will have an accreditation next year even if there is a COVID and uh, the means would be online distance learning at least in the university syllabus is one crucial thing in basic education we prepare the syllabus UBD for the whole semester, including all of the assessments to be done, budget plan of the lessons, map of intersections of advocacies of the schools with the lesson. Um, so that that actually is the comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just like to thank you for that comment. It's just, uh, I think, a reflection of what's going on, right? Uh, we are not hitting the brakes yet, <laughs> parang ganon. So we don't have time for reflection and to assess whether we are on the right track. You know, you know this. I think what I'm presenting is, I think, simply a warning. Uh, and most of the literature that you read that warn us against this system, this regime, are uh, literature from places like the UK in particular and the US and Europe 
but the UK in particular, where in they've already started with this as early as the 80s, right? And they are telling us that wait a minute, uh, there's a problem here. Yeah, you, you, yeah. We, I, we hope that you will learn from our experience. Um, so, um, in, in the Philippines, we have not uh, really. Kaya nga, I, I think one of the reasons why I agreed to uh, participate in the conference and 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 say things that I've actually said before is because uh, I think we have not really discussed this issue enough. Um, kaya nagiging business circle lang. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, we have another one. Um, question to Dr. Pao. Uh, one of the strengths of the audit society is its persistence on removing the thought that there is a possible alternative to the status quo. Um, my question is, is critique enough to expose that there is indeed an alternative to the status quo, which does not subsume to the problematic structures of the audit society? Or how should we criticize it? Uh, the question actually came from Neil Sebastian. All right. Uh, um, Jesse, can you read that again? You read the question again, I'm sorry. Uh, is critique enough to expose that there is indeed an alternative to status quo or to the status quo which does not subsume to the problematic structures of the audit society. How should we criticize it? Well, um, critique is not enough, of course. Critique is just a starting point. Um, the, the, um, the role of critique is to expose and to uh, reflect on the problem. Um, but how do we, do we come up with alternative solutions? Uh, I, I think that we could that, that, that part of coming up with alternative solutions is precisely by having conversations like this. Um, uh, kaya, um, the, uh, if you ask me whether um, uh, I have a, you know a solution to the problem. Uh, Mm, not really, to be honest. I don't have a solution to the problem uh, or one, one such solution. What I can do really is, in all honesty, and to be hum in, in my own humble way, I try to do or teach philosophy uh, in, my in, my, in my courses. Uh, in, the, in a way that I think is, is the best way for me to teach philosophy. Um, and and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm, I'm doing it not because I am racing for badges. Uh, I'm doing it not because there's going to be an accreditation next month. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm teaching philosophy despite the fact that I know, I am aware that most of what I do in class are not translatable into uh, the language of total quality management. Um, so um, th th that's my, my uh, humble, re uh, react or humble answer to the question. Uh, I think uh, critique is the starting point, but the, like I said, the purpose of critique is for us to become more aware of the situation and, uh, you know, to uh, come up with solutions that we, that, that we can do on our own the best way we can. Um, I don't know if that is possi it's possible to raise that in a collective, uh, raise that to a collective level. In the Koalam. Uh, in this, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, in the we are uh, in the department of philosophy. There's this. I don't. I wouldn't say conscious, but I don't. But I think there's this unconscious collective, uh, you know, move uh, among the members of the department to, um, you know, to resist. You know, the pitfalls of the system. 
and to focus on the fundamentals. But of course, I agree with Father Jay. We have to play the uh, game a bit, but we should not become uh, victims or we should not fall into the trap of, rest, uh, you know, of limiting our conception of, of, of education that way. I, I, I think that we need to always remember the fundamentals and the fundamentals will remain despite of the, the system that is in place. Eh, sana nga, uh, yun ang mangyari. Okay, um, before I continue to uh, read a few more comments, uh, are there anyone who would like to uh, ask questions via their webcams and uh, their microphones turned on? Okay. Um, let me read a few comments. Uh, we have here. Uh, I guess as, I, uh, yes, sir, friends. Uh, uh, sir, friends, want to say something? Sir, Paul, I'm just curious. The reaction mo sa sa ano sa sinasabi ni Father Jay na uh, that the university has a built-in uh, system or like it's like. Uh, what is your take on that? Is that do you, do you agree that there is really a built-in system in our university, or for that matter, other universities with the same? Uh, I'm not sure. What's your take on that? I'm well, just curious. Well, uh, I think fa when Father Jay said that there's a built-in um, protective system in the university, what he means, as he mentioned already, what he means is that uh, the the identity of the University of Santo Tomas is actually that of a Catholic institution. Um, so as a Catholic institution, uh, it should not, like I said, should not, it should be, become aware that it should not fall into the trap of, you know, uh, shifting totally into, shifting totally to, uh, you know, a, a kind of system that only cares about um, narrow economic goals. Um, that that there is uh, uh, there's actually that 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 USD actually has a, a bigger mission, right? Uh, bigger mission, the lar larger mission, uh, as opposed to limited or narrow missions of accreditation and ranking. Uh, now, uh, my take on that is that hope, because I believe that the Catholic character of the university precisely also, uh, how do I put this, uh, necessitates the teaching of humanities. So if we start teaching the humanities, then uh, we do away with that uh, Catholic character. Or, or... Kaya in as much as the Catholic character is there, uh, then hopefully we are in a position to uh, not fall into the trap, you know? Um, kaya, kaya sana ganun. and um, hopefully um, our administrators will realize the same the same thing um, kaya uh, the question at the end is whether as a community we are going to continue we are aware of that of that character or that identity and how much of what we can contribute, how, how much of what we can do rather, can contribute to the realization of, of, of that vision. Um, I don't know if, I, if that is enough, Franz. Yes, yes, sir, that's very enlightening. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Uh, hello? Um... I think that's Dr. Aguas. Ah, si Dr. Aguas po ba? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, Doc, Dr. Aguas, uh, would you like to say something? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Pao, for that very insightful and critical 
piece. Uh, I've been listening to the discussion, to your exchange uh, with Father Jay, and uh, the, la the last uh, comment or question of France really struck me. So uh, I think uh, the university has this uh, built-in system, right, about it being Catholic. And I think the problem is when the people in the, in the university who should be at the forefront of safeguarding this identity does not recognize or do not recognize this identity. I think uh, it's when we no longer recognize that what composed the university, the students, the teachers, and even the administration are people are human beings. These are, we are not just agents. I mean, we are not just uh, objects. No, we are, we are people, uh, we are a person. And I think we should not lose sight of, of that very fundamental, very fundamental issue. And uh, I think our department should always be at the forefront of, you know, reminding people about this identity that, uh, <clears throat> We are critical, we are rational beings. We are not just like pawns. We can just be pushed to uh, wherever direction other people may lead us. So I, I think uh, it's incumbent upon us, our department to think, always think loud. And what, you, what our department, especially with your leadership before and with of Joby's leadership now. I think uh, some people may not listen to us. Some people may consider us to be noisance, but we just keep going. Uh, I think this conference, our discussion in the department is actually a form of hitting the break. We are hitting the break. And uh, hopefully we will not lose sight of that of that vision, of that character of our university. Because if before the university is at the forefront, forefront of you know, uh, shaping the character of people or shaping societies and institutions, I think now because of globalization and you know, all this industrialization thing, I think it's more of the university being shaped now by these external structures. And I think we should not allow that to happen. We should continue doing what we are doing so that uh, we don't lose our identity in the midst of all this uh, acceleration. Thing. So that's, that's just my piece. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Aguas. Okay, um, perhaps, uh we could entertain at least one last question and uh, not really one last question, but rather I, I can see uh, related questions here by uh, Ma'am Eloisa Bausas and uh, perhaps to Mark Joseph Landing. Okay, um, let me just read them and perhaps... Uh... Okay, yeah. We need the structure, otherwise the university would not come to be. If TQM uh, TQMQA is the alienating factor that disconnects management from the academe. What is the slowing down in this obviously unstoppable ride? Can we leave the management to the managers and the molding of society to the academe? And uh, from uh, Mark Joseph Landingen, Hi Doc, who will tell these people to slow down? Uh, what are your proposed activities or inactivities as we are slowing down? Thank you. All right. Uh, first, yung, uh, the, the second question, but I'd like you to repeat the first question later, uh, Je Jesse. L later na. Uh, yung kay Mark muna. Uh, I, I think uh, the question, your question is who will tell them? We're telling them. I am telling them <laughs> to slow down. But it's not just them that slows, should slow down. We, are, we need to slow down. So it's more like it's the... the, the uh, the um the question the message really is not just for the ac the accreditors or the assessors it's also for for us it's also for actually uh, and if you want to ask me the question 
the the most uh, i would say that honestly i'm directing it to the university administrators right to slow down and reflect and go and go and go back to reflecting on the fundamentals and, and discuss these fundamentals with not only accreditors because uh, and discuss them with um, your faculty and with your students. Um, so in other words, there should be a, a, a kind of authentic reflexivity as opposed to um, counterfeit reflexivity, if that makes sense. You know, because in counterfeit reflexivity, we are uh, uh, how do I put this? We are trying to understand ourselves based on the language of based on an external language as opposed to understanding ourselves from within our own context uh, if that makes sense so uh, who will tell them to slow down uh, then tayo i am telling them to slow down i am uh, warning it's like I said. It's it's more of a warning. Let, let us slow down and reflect. So, uh, Doctor Agua said that this conference is a, a form of slowing down. I agree with him uh, that this is a form of of slowing down, so that we had time to reflect. And that's what we do as philosophers. You don't do philosophy in the fly. There's no such thing. You do philosophy uh, when. You do philosophy when you have the time and you have enough space and you have, you know, um, yeah, the, 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 the time that you need to reflect on things. Philosophy takes time. Okay. But uh, um, it, it doesn't happen overnight. As a matter of fact, I, I believe, and, and, and it's just the pessimist in me, that after my talk, Everybody will just go back to their own usual selves, right? But I I want to be uh, uh, I want to be wrong on that point. But hopefully that, that this that this uh, conference will um, make us realize that uh, that we need to continuously reflect on these things. But re reflection is one thing. But of course we have to we also have to uh, act on it. I act on 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 what we have reflected on. Um, how to do that? Um, a teacher style. I mean, teaching is an is is a, is, a, is an applied science. If you want to put uh, put it that way, teaching is an applied science. As a matter of fact, even if uh, I am a highly theoretical um, uh, person, um, much once we do this kind of conversation. We're already, in a way, um, uh, I call this um, applying, or we're already in the process of praxis. Because um, ito ang strength natin, ito ang strength natin as philosophers. Um, and then, if people will listen, then they will have to contribute also to the conversation. You cannot rely on one or two persons. Uh, to solve the problem. Um, if the problem is a collective problem, then it takes more than one person. Um, but uh, th that's what I can do. I can, uh, you know, uh, I can present my views. I can, uh, uh, you know, uh, lay down my criticisms and so on. But uh, it's a it's a conversation. So in that sense, uh, it, it is a, a kind of practical process. Um, so yon yung response ko kay Mark. Uh, what's the the first question again, Jesse? Uh, by Ma'am Eloy Sabaos. Uh, we uh, she says that we need the structure. Otherwise, the university would not come to be. If TQMQA is the alienating factor which disconnects management from the academy. What is slowing down, or what is the slowing down rather, in this obviously unstoppable ride? Can we leave the management to the managers and the molding of society to the academe? That is your question. Yeah, I think. Um, well, it, it it seems like we are in an iron cage of TQMQA, right? 
uh, judging from the description that it's seemingly uh, I call this uh, that we, it seems like rather we cannot escape from it. Um, is there a way out from the system? I think way the way out from the system starts from I think the way we think, right? Uh, the way we the way we understand things. Uh, if we say that, uh, like I said, like I said, I'm I'm more of a pessimist, but because of a pessimist, I'm also my pessimism is actually an optimism, right? Uh, if that makes sense. Um, uh, is there a way out of the system? I think if there's a, w I'm not sure if there's a way out, but if there's a way out, I think uh, the, the way out of the system or the starting point rather of going out of the system is here. Uh, it, it, I mean, uh, the, the, the way we look at things and the way uh, we think about things and the way we, we criticize, the, the way we analyze or criticize the situation. Um, and taking a stand also. Kasi kung sa tingin natin may mali, sabihin natin may mali. Uh, if we feel encroached by the system, then we have to say that. We have to hit the brakes, in other words. That's what I mean by hitting the brakes. Uh, uh, it's just that um, the, uh, my department is... In me in particular is very vocal about it. Um, uh, so it doesn't mean, however, that uh, uh, how do I put this? Um, uh, yeah, I think that's one of the starting points by by being vocal about something that you see that, that doesn't really. You know that, that does not really make sense, yeah, or that there's a disconnect. And there's a disconnect. If you see something wrong, then you have to say it. Kung mali, mali. Uh, I'm not saying that the whole system is wrong. I do believe that, uh, like I said in my presentation, we of course that there, it, it's indisputable that quality is something that we have to. Uh, uphold, you know, in whatever we do, teaching, research, and so on. But what what kind of quality are we talking about? What me how, how are we going to measure quality? Or do we really need to measure it or at least gauge it, assess it the way we are assessing it now? Uh, um, uh, if there's a way um, I think that the, the starting point is yourself as the uh, yourself as the as the academic or the teacher. Um, it, it depends on on. I think it has something to do with with how you 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 you, co you uh, co uh, it has something to do with the dynamics you have with your students, perhaps how you conduct your classes, right? Um, and, 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 and what you think is, is fundamental as opposed to things that are not fundamental. Uh, what are the needs of your students? Uh, but of course, you have to measure that also against what they think they need. Because, of course, we also know that some that students, some, because they are young, young people, they, they, they also don't know what they want. Kaya, kaya nga, uh, I mean, uh, should we treat them as customers? And the customers are the customer is always right, or is there a way of um, uh, you know looking at looking at it, looking at learning from a different vantage point, which is not really new, not different, because uh, it's something that perhaps already existed even before the industrial revolution. Right. Uh, if you study how things are done in medieval universities, or even in ancient Greece, you know how uh, how learning was done during those times. Um, uh, then we might perhaps learn learn from ancient pedagogy, right? 
or medieval pedagogy uh, uh, and, 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 you know, and perhaps learn from, uh, from things that are old as opposed to things that are new. And that's, uh, that's going to be our, our, our new, new. Um, kaya, kaya, kaya parang mahirap, ano, kasi nga, of course, uh, and that's precisely the problem. The mere fact, let me end it with this. Uh, let my answer with this. The mere fact that you think that it seems like it's an iron cage that cannot be that you cannot escape from the mere fact that it feels that way it means that there's something wrong and what wrong about it we, uh, you can just read literature i've mentioned quite uh, i've mentioned some so, uh, I mentioned a few things that's wrong about the system but uh, it's perhaps also your 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 job or your i you know a choice, if you want, to look into, um, look deeper into the problems of, of, of um, the system. Uh, do we need a, yeah, I'm not against structure, I'm not against system, uh, but, uh, I, but I'm for some, some form of balance. No, I'm, I'm for some form of balance. I'm not saying that we have to do away with any auditing system. What, what I'm saying is that we have to hit the brakes so that we we will we should that so that we start understanding uh, that maybe we are accelerating too much, and that we in that in the process of acceleration we we are forgetting the fundamentals. Okay, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Can I? May you ask? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes, po, uh, Sir Tus, uh, Ernesto Spadilla. Oh, okay. Tus. No, may, uh, Tus. Uh, good, uh, good evening. May I just have a suggestion, Doc Pao? Mm. Instead of hitting the brakes, perhaps we should better step on the accelerator. I think we need to crash before we even wake up. Uh, because the total quality management is actually is a misnomer because it's a total quantity management. Mm, so exactly. it's maintaining the exactly. numbers. And even in business, there have been a lot of failed business because of this maintaining the numbers. It's actually one of the first signs of an ethical collapse in, in corporate culture. So, so this meltdown in companies, we should be like Enron, you know, we should crash so that we will wake up. And I'm wondering why schools are not even learning from the mistakes in the field of business and religion where fanaticism with instant miracles or shortcuts prevail. So I think education should be played as an infinite game where focus slowness, like the slowness of Ernestus <laughs> is a virtue and, and, and not a finite game where speed is God. Thank you, Doc. Thank no. you. You know what I mean when I, when I say that we need to crash. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, Doc. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? Uh, maybe we will crash. We will crash soon. Anytime soon, we will crash. Uh, and yun nga ang problema eh. uh, We because we are not learning from me, fr from messages, you know, from uh, from let's say learning from history because it already has its own history of failures. Um, uh, because we are not learning. Uh, Sooner or later, we're going to crash, and that's also the uh, the how do I put it? The tragic thing about it because kina kailangan pa nating magcrash before we learn, no? But sometimes maybe we need that sort of br uh, breakage, if you want, you know. The, um, pero siguro if you imagine uh, hitting the brakes, but because it's too too fast, the brakes will not work anymore. You will crash anyway. Uh, um, sabi mo na lang, ay, nawalan kami ng ano, ng, ng preno. Uh, kaya lang, ang dami ng ano, namatay, ang dami ng uh, disgrasya. Uh, but, but yeah, um, I, I think it could, I think uh, sooner or later, we're going, it, it will, 
it will lead to some kind of um, accident, not accident, but crash. Uh, the way you the way you describe it, maybe there are two possible ways. Either we hit the brakes now, but but hitting the brakes doesn't mean stopping it. Hitting the brakes mean means okay, let's stop and reflect. That's what I mean by hitting the brakes. Um, uh, the other way, of course, is your suggestion. Maybe we should just uh, okay, bahala na, iba. Uh, kailang I'm worried that uh, if we press on the accelerator and we crash, I'm not too sure if there will be survivors. So yun naman yung uh, the other the other side of the the the, store, the, you know, the coin, right? So thank you, Tus. And I know what you mean by the slowness of Tus. <laughs> thank you very much for Doc, your first you... chapter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you okay. for your brilliant insights as usual, Doc, as always. Thank you very thank you, much, Doc. Okay, uh, thank you, Doc, and uh, thank you, Sir Tus. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Bolaños, and uh, thank you to our de dear participants for the questions and comments. I was actually reading the chat box and uh, we do have a lot of insightful questions and comments from our participants. Uh, unfortunately, we have to officially close our engagement session due to time constraints. It's already past 6 p.m. Um, again, we thank Dr. Bolaños for providing your time for us in this session and sharing the what the fruits of your um, research have something to say about the university, specifically speed, mobility, uh, metrics, cultural and social political problems of the metric system that plague the university, uh, continues to plague the university and its ideal features of being an institution of higher learning. Uh, thank you, Doc, for the time. Uh, as we now officially close the lecture session, let us hear from the closing remarks uh, prepared by one of the editors-in-chief of Critique, an online journal of philosophy, Dr. Roland Teo Aspada. <laughs> 